We are joined by Elton Bruins, a longtime religion professor at Hope College, and now one of the college historians. And Elton, we're going to need you very strongly today to talk about the history of this marvelous structure and also to share with us the beauty, why we so appreciate this marvelous place. With that, I'm going to quote a quote from the early newspaper that was written, a student newspaper that was written at the time the building was completed. And it states that the chapel stands flawlessly in its grandeur, like a beautiful hymn turned to stone. I'm not sure we can top that sentence, but begin to tell us about this marvelous structure. Thank you. I'm happy to do so. Those words nicely describe the work of President Edward D. Dimnett, the fifth president of the Hope College, who designed this building and brought it to completion. His, his uh, administration took place from 1918 until 1931. And uh, there was an immediate felt need when he became president. The student body was growing. As a result, Winant's Chapel in Gray's Library was not, uh, no longer large enough to hold the student body because at that time, until 1970 in fact, every student had an assigned seat in College Chapel for what we called required chapel. So he said, we, uh, from a practical point of view, we need a new chapel. From a, 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 say, an aesthetic point of view, I think he said, we want to build a very fine building. And he, being the man he was, and being a very cultured gentleman, ha had a design and had a great deal to do with the design of this building. But uh, that wasn't enough, of course. He needed an architect. So uh, by uh, mid-20s, when by, at least by 1926, he already had $100,000 raised for the, for the building of the chapel. And that was a significant amount because uh, 100000 exceeded the, college, the whole college budget in 1926. So he knew this building was going to cost a lot of money, and it did. So that by the time it was under construction in 1927, it was estimated that it was going to cost $200,000. Then what was say, all more significant is that with cost overrun, the final cost was $404,000. Now what is significant about that is that even though we were in very good times in the 20s, yes. and only a matter of months after the college was dedicated in June of 1929, we had the crash of the stock market in, in October. So we had an amazingly president, amazing president with great foresight, great courage, commitment and apparently a great ability to raise money so that he could dream to this point and already have a hundred thousand and be willing to go out into four hundred thousand dollars to construct this structure. And two other significant things there is one he wanted to call it the Memorial Chapel oh. uh, because it was in memory of all the people who have worked hard to make Hope College a success and then what is also remarkable uh, from my point of view there's no record of what Yes. Uh, what the debt was when the building was finished in June of 1929. And it is generally assumed that he, whatever debt there was, he covered it with, with himself. He had the reputation of being an astute stock picker. So he, whatever fortune he has, I think, went into the final payment of this building. So after he died, putting the name Dimnit on this wonderful chapel was a very appropriate thing to do. And that took place in 1959. <laughs> yes. Now, one other quick point. The chapel is a useful tool, used by the students today, used by the community today. Talk about that a bit. It's widely used. It's, it's as important to the college campus today as the uh -huh. day it was built, because the, all the college chapels are held here. And then one of the reasons for building it also was to serve the, the community. Uh, as well as the college community. And not only does it serve the chapel programs here, it serves all the concerts. Uh, it serves the music department. We don't yet have a concert hall, so this has to serve as a concert hall. But then, then the Holland Chorale will be here again. The Holland Symphony it plays here. So it, it serves yet a dual purpose. Even the building now is nearly 80 years old. Here's this marvelous structure and being used a great deal and what a marvelous asset to every student coming here, but also to the community of Holland. Um, Elton, we're now going to go inside, and one of the early quotes also from the early newspaper said that the true beauty of the chapel exists and rests 
in the fantastic windows that are in the building. So we're going to go in and take a look at those windows and start talking about the interior of the building. Dr. Bruins, as can be seen, we've now moved inside the chapel. And to begin with, let's talk about the interior structure and particularly the furniture that make this such a marvelous place. I think the most important thing to note is that our pulpit furniture, or the furniture on the platform, both of the lectern and the chairs, uh, were made in India in the 1920s at a mission school called Katpati. It was a Dutch Reformed Church uh, mission school there to train young Indians in, in a craft. So I think that's the most important part about the interior. Uh, the, you, we have our pews, very, very good pews over, of over the years. And then over the years, in the almost 80 years now, there's been some modification. Sure. In fact, the platform on which we're seated now was extended a few years ago so that it can readily accommodate uh, large choruses or orchestras and, and used for concerts very readily. So the practical part of the, uh, the, the furniture is also 80 years old and it's been maintained well and we just have kept this wonderful example of creativity and art. Yeah. There's been some modification with the technical side now with our uh, board out there for the, for the microphones, etc. But it's basically as it was when it was dedicated in 1929. Now, as we said from the outside, the windows are the what make this such an amazing structure. What are some general comments about the windows? Where did they come from? How were they created? Tell us that story, please. Uh, Dr. Dimnett went to the Payne Hardy Studios in New Jersey for crafting the windows. But whether he or they knew the person, but it was a, a, a European by the name of Signor Succi, uh, an Italian who lived in Venice, who was the designer of the windows. He was a, uh, his specialty was uh, the medieval Europe uh, cathedral. And so he was very aware of the, media, of the cathedral windows in Europe. So when he designed them in particular, he brought a great background with him. Now I'm sure that Dr. Dimnett had a lot to say with them also because of the symbolism and what went into the window. I imagine it would have been Dr. Dimnett who suggested that there would be two full-size figures in these windows. There are uh, six windows on each side, 12 figures on each side for a total of 24. The Virgin Mary, is uh, Mother Mary, is seen on both sides of there, so she's double, so there would be 25 people. Now, some of them are Old Testament figures like Moses and some of the prophets. The others are New Testament figures like the Apostle John, the Apostle Bartholomew. I think there's Andrew. There's also uh, the John the Baptist and people like that. So your, 12, uh, your 24 figures are biblical figures. Yeah. Then what you have to do too when you come in and look at the windows is to study the symbolism that you find at the mid-level, or the, the, the level uh, midway, shall we say. And just as I look at one window, I see the symbol of the Bible, and I see a chalice. In another window, I see the anchor, which is an important symbol for hope. In another one, I see the descending dove. In, a third, in another one, I see three lilies on one stem, a symbol of the Trinity. So you just go down these, up and down these windows and realize how much symbolism there is in them to say nothing about the chancel window and the rose window. So, um, it wasn't just stained glass window that said, make this a beautiful place. Every window has an immense story to tell and the creativity and the design was a powerful part of putting it together and that we today sit and appreciate. You really have to sit in the pews some, on a nice day and just, just keep looking around and to see the variety of the symbols that we have here. And again, from the outside, when we mention the, the students use this regularly for chapel services, etc. But that kind of relationship and learning from these windows continues, uh, and it's a powerful opportunity. Now, one quick story, if I may tell a story. Uh, we have a pictures that show that as the building was being built, the structures for balconies down both sides of the chapel were structurally in place. But as the windows arrived, they realized the beauty of the window and therefore 
the steel, the structure was taken out for the side balconies so it would not interfere with the beauty of the windows. Well, it's a very interesting fact, Frank, because as that picture showed, it would have covered at least three windows on each side rather than the one window on each side. And th those balconies would have added a great deal to the seating capacity. And if you think of them, the seating would have been very interesting. You'd have that whole oval or uh, that uh, horseshoe of uh, balcony. Yeah. But I, they, with good sense, they took that out, which had to have led to this major cost overrun because they anticipated the chapel to cost 200000 and it ended up at 404000 uh, now, if we can transfer our thinking to the chancel window, which is in itself a story that we want to hear in great detail. I think it's second only to the rose window in significance. The, the, first of all, the focus is on Christ uh, uh, with the children and is known for his blessing of the children, loving children, and saying, unless you are like a child, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Then on the side, on the, just to our right, is a, a woman with two small children. Don't know who they represent, nor the couple just to, on the left side of that, but a man and woman with a child, again, coming to Jesus. Now the one on the left, far left uh, are the three shepherds, I believe. And the, the symbol there would be that they were the first ones to hear of Christ's birth and came to the stable to see the Christ child. And the fact that one, knowing they are shepherd is significant, so it'd be normal to have a lamb but I would even pour more symbolism in that in saying that when John the Baptist met Jesus, he said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So you, you have that significance, I think, in that picture. Now, above the one, above the, each of the side windows, you have on the right, you have what is an R, and it looks like there's an X through it. Well, those are Greek letters, chi, rho, and they, that's the Greek symbol for the name of Christ. And on the left, you have what appear to be three Latin letters. They are three Latin letters, IHS, which stand for the Latin term for Christ. So again, I'm sure Dimnit, if not Suchi, would have had that kind of knowledge and would, inc would increase. So the chancel window really focuses on Jesus. And, and then the two insignia on either side, the Latin and the Greek terms for the term Christ the Messiah. Elton, we have just talked about the majesty of the side windows and the chancel windows. And we now have the one window that stands out and without question is the best known and that's the awesome rose window so we're going to go up and take a look at that the rose window. And a point of interest is that to notice all the major lines in that window are made of stone. And a personal story. My father spent 45 years as a stonemason, bricklayer in the West Michigan area. And throughout his total career, the thing he talked about the most and was most proud of was that he and another stonemason lay the stone that created this rose window. Dr. Bruins, that window has much to say, and we're simply asking you to please share the stories, the message that is displayed in the petals of that window. Thank you, I'm very happy to do so, because it is, uh, the, if the chapel is, uh, is the crown jewel of the campus, the rose window is the crown jewel of the chapel. Let's begin in the center with the explanation. The center depicts the seal of Hope College, which was adopted in 1866, uh, the year the college was incorporated. Philip Phelps, the first president, must have been the designer of this seal. Interestingly enough, it was originally uh, used English language for it. Somewhere in the process of time, it was, the English was translated into Latin. So all the wording in that seal now today is Latin. But what we first see in the sea seal is the anchor. And this is interesting because this is, goes back to the 
words of Van Ralty himself when he wrote his first report following uh, the first year of the Holland Academy in 1852. He said, this is my anchor of hope for the future. So that, the anchor, became a vital part. And, and we also noted that the, the anchor is also used in symbols in the chapel windows along the side. Then this anchor, this word, these words, the anchor of hope for the future, comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 6, verse 19. But the word hope, as it is used, it comes from Psalm 42, 1. And th that, that scripture is mentioned in the seal also. And then that's why the motto of hope is hope thou in God or spera in deo. And, and so that comprises the seal of Hope College. Now, because Dr. Dimnit placed the emphasis on that, I think he wanted to have seals of six other schools of learning, six universities that are the, here that are depicted with their seals. The first one is the seal of the University of Leiden, a, a Dutch a Dutch university, founded in 1575, the year that the Dutch founded that in Thanksgiving for overthrowing the Spaniards and getting them out of the country. But I think he picked that university because that's the school from which Van Ralty graduated uh, when in the early 1830s. Then he goes to the five university in this country. Now I would have assumed, before I looked carefully at the window, that the first one would be Harvard, which is the oldest university in the country, founded in 1636. But it isn't. It's the uh, seal of Rutgers University, founded in 1766. But he was partial to Rutgers because it was the first institution of learning founded by the Dutch Reformed Church in this country. So the second one, following Leiden, is Rutgers. But then he does it, the rest are, the other four are in alphabetic or in chronological order. Namely, Harvard, 1636, Yale, 1701, Princeton, 1746, and the university, a, a secular state university, uh, in 1817. Although he used the number 1837, which is the year that the state of Michigan entered the United States and joined the Union. So that completes that circle. Then the next circle are paddles of identical design. It's in the last circle, the large circle. And there we begin at the top, just to the right of the top, and go uh, clockwise. The first one is the creation of the world. Then you go drop down a bit, you get to the Garden of Eden, and there are Adam and Eve enjoying the Garden of Eden. But the next one shows the effect of their act in the Garden of Eden when they disobeyed God. And here Adam is depicted hoeing in the garden or working the land as a result, as a payment for his sin, that now it was tough going for this first pair. Then the next one, however, we see the plan of redemption initiated by God with the picture uh, of Moses, the, who received the call of God, led the uh, exodus out of Egypt and into the promised land. And that's followed, interestingly enough, by a picture of what is conceived to be the Ark of the Covenant. And this was this very sacred uh, piece of our instrument in the tabernacle and then later in the temple, which symbolized the presence of God in the midst of his people. Then following that is the glory of the state of Israel, or the country of Israel, people of Israel with a picture of Solomon. Here Solomon sits on his throne with his robes and with the, the crown on his head. This is at the peak of the Old Testament in their prosperity and in, in their monarchy. It's downhill from here. And the next picture shows that. And here a man, a person is sitting beneath a tree in Babylon, moaning the fact that the people of Israel now are in exile in this country and away from the promised land. But the picture of redemption is concluded in the top picture just to the left of the opposite to creation of the world is the birth of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. So that really completes this full picture that is seen here. The Seal of Hope College, the universities that Dimnit thought were significant in this country, surrounded by the, the story of redemption that concludes with the coming of Christ. We are now going to talk about the sounds of the chapel, particularly the organs that make the chapel a complete 
experience. As you can see, we've moved from celebrating the majestic windows in the chapel, and now we're by this marvelous Skinner organ, and Dr. Bruins, let's talk about the marvelous musical instruments that are on this campus. Uh, we Just to briefly note that we do have three organs, major organs on the campus now. This one, of course, the Skinner, which is 1929, the Pels Van Leeuwen organ in the balcony, 1971, given by the Heckman family, and then our third one, which is also a gift to the college that is located in Professor uh, Hugh Lewis's studio in uh, Nykirk Hall. This one is special because it's the largest one also. It's a romantic organ. In comparison with the Van Leeuwen organ, uh, Pels Van Leeuwen, which is a Baroque organ. Sure. This was, say, as I said, 1929, built by the, probably the best company at that time, the Skinner, or a company located in Boston. It uh, is a large organ. It is an organ of four ranks, as you can see in the keyboard. Uh, but you can't see the 2,932 pipes that the organ has. And they are located in three locations. The two locations are in the front of the chapel, in these organ chambers on each side of the, of the choir law. The third one is in the southwestern corner of the by the balcony there, where you have another set of pipes that are uh, given. Now, as the time went on, it's been amazing that uh, the organ has stood up so well. So uh, when it came to the restoration, we, we went to a great deal of time and expense to do that. What was marvelous, what I wanted to say earlier, Frank, was that the, because Hope was not well off and with following organists, they didn't, shall we say, quote unquote, mess with the organ, wanted to make this improvement and make that change. So when the Thompson Allen Organ Company, Restoration Company there in New Haven, Connecticut, saw it and did the work of restoration, they now consider it three of the finest Skinner organs in existence in the country. Um, and I believe that by the time they were finished with the restoration, uh, and as we stated earlier, $25,000 for the organ originally, to replace the organ today would be to the sum of approximately $2 million. In fact, the restoration, I believe, was... Three quarters of a million Three quarters dollars. of a million dollars. Right, right. Now, to understand what that restoration was involved oh. with was that all the pipes had to be taken out and they were laid across the, pool, the pews of the campus here. And then the console and all the pipes, all the pipes were shipped to New Haven, Connecticut for the restoration. And so that took about two years in order to get that all done. But thanks to the encouragement and urging of Professor Lewis and thanks to President James Boltman that we were willing to spend that kind of money, we now have this magnificent organ fully restored and truly a queen of the instruments here at Hope College and even in the country.